And we do have Brooklyn on. Hopefully you can hear me. If not, hit the chat. Okay, here's the plan. Shh. Um, I feel like I did this first hour. I don't know, did you think it was valuable? Okay, um, it's a little weird. I don't know most of you and there's no reason like you should give a crap about anything I say, <laughs> right? But I wanna talk to you a little bit about uh, the 20 year anniversary of 9-11. How many of you have already had that in a class? Raise your hand. So just a handful of you. Um, I personally think it'd be awesome if all of us just didn't teach anything today except for talking about our own personal experiences on September 11th. But I can't really tell all the teachers what to do. I mean, I can, but they'll ignore me and even more of them will start hating me. Um, so for the first 20 whatever minutes, I'm just gonna share my own personal experience. Um, if you'll be just respectful um, and quiet. And, wow, they are loud out there. Um, we'll just get through it. Um, I might get a little emotional because it was a hard day. It was a really, really hard day for anyone that was alive in the United States that day. Um, so <clears throat> when I was a kid, I got the awesome fortune to go to the top of the World Trade Center twice. Uh, it was really pretty cool. If you ever have seen a picture of the towers, there was World Trade Center 2, I believe, and 1 had the tower. You could go to the observation deck here, which was outside. Um, it was The inside one was actually cooler because when you're inside, you could go like touch the window and get that feeling. Anyone been in a really tall building and you get that like, ha, ah, that feeling. Um, but you could go on the roof and look out too, but you couldn't even get, like the edge was probably from here to the wall. It's like, it was cool, but it was like, well, it wasn't as cool. But anyway, I was really lucky to be able to do that. I'd been lucky enough to ride up the elevators. I'd been lucky enough to know how many people are in these buildings. Um, it's actually really fortunate that 10 times the amount of people um, didn't die that day. So anyway, my personal experience, anyone um, that's, I don't know, 25 to 30 years old or older, definitely knows exactly where they were that moment of their life. Um, I had, had just driven my wife to work on Old Main Hill um, at Utah State, dropped her off and I was coming down the hill and my radio talk show I listened to, they were never serious, but suddenly they cut off the song and they, they got real serious. And they said, we don't have a lot of details, but we've heard reports that a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. And I thought, holy cow, it's like the worst luck ever. There's an entire atmosphere to fly through and they accidentally hit a building with a lot of people in it. Um, and I look at the clock and I thought it was pretty early pretty lucky, probably a lot of people weren't at work still. But anyway, I thought it was a pretty big deal, but then I got home and I went in and I turned the TV on and then I saw the pictures, the live video, um, and I knew, wow, that's a huge deal. And you're all just watching, like the whole country is watching the TV right now and thinking, how on earth could a plane have accidentally hit that? And you're not expecting a thing. And then you watch live, on TV, a plane hit the second tower. And then you knew there, this wasn't an accident. This was on purpose. And then you heard news reports that a uh, plane had hit the Pentagon. And then you absolutely had no doubt in your mind that the United States of America was under attack. Uh, and it was, it was awful. It was a tough, tough day to watch TV. We were all glued to the TV. I eventually had to go to school, to class, thank you. Um, I went to chemistry, in fact, um, and the teacher who happened to be from Saudi Arabia was stressed. And no one knew what was going on at the time, um, but uh, Corbin, Oh, that, these are open, sorry, they're not sealed. They don't travel very far. 
not you, you. Sorry, Olivia, right? Nope, Olivia. Wow, well, you're tall. There we go. I'm usually pretty good at throwing these, but not when they're not sealed. Yep. Anyway, he, he was immediately worried about the effects on his life, which there were some. But anyway, that's where I was. That was my day. I had been there. I had known what was in these buildings. Let me just play this for a second. 64 degrees at 8 o'clock. It's Tuesday, September 11th. Harris, here's what's happening. Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. An ordinary day in New York City. At 8.46 a.m., that normalcy ends suddenly when hijackers from the terrorist group Al-Qaeda deliberately crash American Airlines Flight 11 into the 110-story North Tower at the World Trade Center. First responders immediately rush to help. Dispatch, Cap Brown, Light of Three, get back to the World Trade Center. Yeah. I'm on the 35th floor, okay? Okay. Just related to command post. There's no, uh, we're trying to get up. You know, numerous civilians in all stairwells, numerous burn injuries are coming down. I'm trying to send them down first. Apparently, it's above the 75th floor. I don't know if they got there yet, okay? Okay. It's a free truck, and we're still heads up, all right? Okay. Thank you. All 11 firefighters responding from FDNY Ladder Company 3, including Captain Patrick Brown, would be killed that morning. 441 first responders die as a result of the attacks, the largest loss of emergency personnel in American history. Just 17 minutes later at 9.03 a.m., it becomes clear that this is a deliberate attack when hijacked United Flight 175 crashes into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. At 9.37 a.m., a third hijacked plane, American Flight 77, is flown directly into the Pentagon, headquarters of the United States Department of Defense in Arlington, Virginia. Back in Lower Manhattan, at 9.59 a.m., the unimaginable happens. The South Tower collapses. Meanwhile, a fourth hijacked plane heads toward Washington, D.C. Passengers and crew aboard United Flight 93 learn from phone calls about the attacks that have already occurred. With this information, the passengers and crew storm the cockpit. In response, the hijackers crash the plane in an empty field outside Shanksville, Pennsylvania, just 20 minutes from Washington, D.C. All aboard are killed. Back in New York City at 10.28 a.m., the North Tower collapses 102 minutes after being struck. On September 11th, 2,977 people from over 90 nations are killed. It's pretty cool. So you've been to the museum. Who else? Anyone been to the Memorial Museum? You you should go. Absolutely, without doubt, ever, you should go. I have been blessed and honored to attend there. So I just want to show you my pictures of that day. Two years ago, this was two weeks before, uh, well, maybe three weeks-ish, before COVID shut everything down. We went on a trip to Washington, D.C. with the student government. And one morning we woke up and Mr. Roberts said, hey, we should go to New York. I thought it was a terrible idea, but I'm extremely grateful that Jesse had that idea and that I didn't convince him it was stupid. Washington, D.C. and New York are not super close. It's, it would be like driving to, uh, I, I don't know, like Nephi from here. So it's not real far, not real close, but you got to realize there's like 40 million people between there. So it, it took some while. We had to pay quite a bit of tolls, but we made it. These are some pictures from the 9-11 Memorial, if I go the right direction. So this is actually some structure that's still left um, from the fall of the towers. This was the wall that kept the East River back because in New York, Manhattan is pretty much all underwater. As soon as you get below dirt, there's no, there's no elevation. They have to dig very far down to get to bedrock 
and that bedrock is surrounded with water. So they build, they build a container um, around where they're gonna build stuff and then they build it. So though that, those walls are still there. This is one of the original footings of the foundation. It's one of the only things that never really fell. It's still there. Um, we'll see some more things, I think it's this way. I took a ton of pictures of this wall and I don't know why, it just, it just spoke to me. This whole museum is quiet. It's thoughtful. It's probably the second most, like besides church to me, it's the second most sacred place I've ever been in my life. Um, it's just, it's incredible. Um, this video was a little before, but this is just a, a bunch of metal um, hanging down. Who we got here? Keeley, end of class somewhere. The way that's written, I can't read it very easy. Um, we'll keep going. These are called the survivor stairs. Um, the way things worked out, the subway was down here and thousands of people that day evacuated down into the subways and then were evacuated. They had to come down these stairs. Um, and then eventually the lower part, when the buildings collapsed, they were destroyed, but they're still there. They've left them there as part of the museum. It's very, really emotional to know thousands of people went down that in a hurry. Uh, this is part of the radio tower that was on the North Tower, I believe. So it's part of that piece right there. When you, you probably, I don't know if you've ever watched a video of, of it falling, it just falls straight down on itself. And the radio tower, mostly you can see it and then it's just surrounded by dust. And then at the end, it's, it's just destroyed, obviously. This is more of the radio tower, uh, just another angle. This is a piece of pure iron, just completely shredded. It's called a box column. Um, this to me was pretty cool because I've, I've ridden on those elevators and this was the elevator motor. It, it's huge. The elevators went really fast um, and really far, 110 stories. Um, and you could go to the observation deck, so 111. Uh, this, I don't know, how'd you feel about this fire truck? Like it was the most powerful thing to me in the whole museum. This is Ladder Company 3's truck. Everyone that arrived in this truck, they were the first first responders. They went up to the 70th floor and then they never came home. They did their duty because um, it was their job and because they love people. This is the front of the truck. It was crushed and burned. Here's the back where some pieces had fallen. There's not a single picture that I could get that took in the whole aspect of the truck. And there's no way a picture can give you the feeling that we experienced when we looked at that truck. I highly recommend that you go. So there's a ton of pictures of it because it was just, awe inspiring it's probably too quiet um more and more so there's ladder company number three um this this is the front these are all ladders that they typically would use but obviously you can't put ladders up to the 73rd story so they were on the truck still when everything was crushed Um, there's a picture of that truck and just the disaster. The reading this is pretty impressive. I don't, I don't think we could read it, but maybe we can. So I'll read it for you if I can get through it. Assigned to aid in the evacuation of civilians in the North Tower 9-11, members of the Fire Department of New York Ladder Company 3 are known to have reached the 35th. Okay, sorry, they didn't get to the 70th before it fell. By 921. Captain Patrick Patty John Brown 
unable to communicate directly with the lobby command post, used a functioning office telephone to call a Manhattan dispatcher. He reported that burn victims and numerous others were making their way down the stairs and that he understood the fire to be above the 75th floor. In his last recorded transmission, Captain Brown said, three truck and we're still heading up. So this is just right off the video too. Three truck and we're still heading up. All 11 uh, members of the ladder company were killed uh, inside the building when it collapsed at 1023. Hi guys. All right, pretty powerful if you're there, if you've been there. And there's another view of the front, just completely destroyed. On September 12th, you woke up with the hope and the New York hospitals were ready. And you had this hope and expectation that they'd be finding all these survivors. And they found zero. There was never a survivor from the building collapse. They had either evacuated completely um, or they died. Did you guys need some? Okay, the custodians probably cleaned them. Um, there's that piece again you'd seen in one of the original pictures. It's one of the only things that never fell. There's the wall, to me it was inspiring. This was a gigantic piece of metal that co it controlled the flow of cold water from the East River in to help with the climate control. Um, this was a big gas tank that ran the generators and it, it's just gone. Um, this piece of metal just completely folded over and bent. Unbelievable forces involved in this. Then this one, this is, I don't know. Did you cry in there? Yeah, like I was a baby. Cause I had these memories. I had been in that building and I'd watched this on live TV. These are little cards that people put memories of their loved ones that didn't make it. And this is a really big wall. Then it goes into a room. And in the room, it's, it's, it's kind of big, but they have a lot more pictures. And then they have audio playing. Um, and the audio are like clips from like family videos or whatever, um, or the hardest ones to listen to are the, the voicemails that people in the tower left for their loved ones. And they'll like highlight the picture of the person talking and then you hear them like, honey, I don't know if I'm gonna make it. And then they just talk and it, whew, the dad in me just got shook that day. A lot of them said, tell the kids I love them. And that was it. Extremely powerful, extremely powerful. I'm probably about done with this slideshow. Uh, the videos don't load. Um, this is what's replaced it. If you ever get to go here, it is an incredible building and you can go to the top of this. Did you do that? Oh my heavens. It's, it's, the, it's cool. It's cooler than going to the old one. You get in the elevator and you go up and you're at the observation deck, which is not quite at the top. It doesn't matter where it is. And they, everyone leaves the elevators and it's a really narrow hall. So like the elevators are here and then everyone comes right here. And then there's a wall with a bunch of art on it. And they, they tell you about the tour. And then all of a sudden that wall lowers and there is all of New York City. It is unbelievably breathtaking unbelievably just beautiful um i guess it would be it would be this direction like the wall just opens and that's that's what you see like from here to that wall that window's right there it's beautiful um my friends two of the very hardest days of my entire life was this day watching this on TV, going to school, hearing the sound of an airplane, because uh, they grounded every single plane 
for a while. It was crazy. Everything was silent. And then all of a sudden you'd hear a plane and you're like that. They just, it was creepy. You just, it was a, a crazy experience. The other day that changed kind of how I felt and made me feel vulnerable and awful. And it was similar to this because it was just live streamed on TV. Uh, and that was the Columbine school shooting. And if you haven't heard of that, just trust me, it was awful. That was in Colorado. My cousins were from Littleton, which was the same city. They went to a different high school. Uh, so that was real. And it was on live TV. And you saw people dead, like on TV. Um, both those things have something in common. And it's the, the, those days. It's that those actions were grounded in people's hatred. So this same trip, we went to a different place. We went to the Martin Luther King Memorial. And I've been there twice in case anyone's keeping track. This was actually taking a different trip, but whatever. This quote is incredible to me in every possible way. And it says, darkness cannot drive out darkness. We can't light up a dark room with a black piece of paper. That doesn't work. That's physically correct. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. I love this quote. I love what it teaches. I love that I feel I can do something. I can't stop a terrorist attack, but I can be better at just loving. And that's my challenge to you. My challenge to you is to love more. People a lot of times complain about a school not being a very nice, fun, accepting, whatever place. And it's probably true. There's a lot of misunderstanding that a lot of times leads to darkness and hate. But we can conquer that if we'll love. All the bombs in the world are not going to stop terrorists from attacking people they hate. That's just going to happen. But we personally ourselves can make our lives better if we love more, love more often and embrace that. So my real challenge to you today, and we're halfway through it, every time you do a class change is to look someone in the eye and smile and ask them how they're doing. That simple act of making eye contact with someone can change their day or change their lives. If we will love, we'll be better off in every aspect of our life. Now, a lot of you may be sitting here thinking, well, no one loves me. <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, I was a teenager once. Everyone thinks they're alone in a boat, but you're all alone in the same sinking boat. <laughs> it's going to be fine. I promise. But if you need a friend and you feel lonely, my advice is to be the best friend you want someone to be to you. If you will make eye contact, if you will smile and you will love unconditionally, you will end up having a lot of friends and surviving. I know high school is not kind. I went to high school. I liked high school. I went to junior high. How about that? I hate it. <laughs> and if you had me last year, you know about those stories and we'll share them later this year. But please make eye contact and love someone today. Honor the 2,900 victims of 9-11 by simply smiling and being someone someone can count on. Who can do that? Raise your hand. Okay. I know that's a little bit of a weird conversation from uh, your science teacher. I think chemistry is important. I think AP chemistry is important, but I think life and love and appreciating others is about 10,000 times more important. And there's sometimes as teachers and as human beings, 
we need just to step back in most of our life and think, am I being kind? Am I loving the way I want to be loved? And so I'll just wrap that up there. Any questions or comments? Okay. Well, I gave you the chance to not talk about sig figs, but no one had any comments. So let's get super excited and talk about significant figures. Who's excited? That was good timing. I they think it's locked. I told them just to come in 20 minutes and I'd be done and boom, I was just done. Brooklyn, sorry if you felt that was not worth being zoomable, but whatever, hopefully it was good. All right, so we can see today the goal is calculations using significant figures. All right, the chapter one test will be Tuesday. You know today was a success when you can or have accurately determined the number of significant figures in a given number. Raise your hand if you're okay with that. You think you can do that, okay? Next is to do calculations and report answers using the correct significant figure. During B time, I had this slide right here open and my son and his friends came in and they saw the bottom right corner and they're like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I was like, well, son, welcome to AP Chemistry. We'll talk about how those are three different values, um, but make sure, let's start off with a little question here. How many, tell your partner, not me, how many significant figures are in this number? One point zero zero three zero. Tell your partner how many sig figs in that number? All right, the most common I heard was five, which is the right answer. How come the zero on the end matters? Because there's a decimal, you guys are amazing. If there's a decimal, you count pretty much every number, unless what would you not count? Zeros at the beginning, thank you, Meyer. Zeros at the beginning wouldn't matter. All right, what if I had, I'm gonna switch it up. What if I had 10.030? Five, that doesn't matter at all, right? What if I had 10030? Tell your partners how many? Four, how come the end doesn't matter this time? There's no decimal. Be okay with that? Sandwiched or captive, uh, zeros in the middle always count. Zeros at the front never count. Zeros at the end, as long as if there's a decimal, they all count. If not, none of them count. Okay, here we go. So hopefully that's just golden. Next, do calculations report answers using the correct number of significant figures. So here we go. When we do math with measured values, we have to follow some rules. So here we go. This is another slide where every word is important. I would take a picture of it or screenshot it for those that are going along or take a, you know, very quick notes. All right, this is also sort of set up for two column notes if you like it. But here we go. There are two rules. I hope I look good in all those pictures. Well, never mind. I look good in every picture. Wow. Wait a minute. From here, it looks like I'm literally flipping you off. Okay. Yeah. From over here, I was like, oh, no. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. Two separate rules. You Let's open that door again. That will get some air through. The lights are LED lights. They don't really produce heat, but I'll leave them off because it will produce the illusion of heat. Is this going to be too loud? Okay, yeah, it is. The problem with the school, we know it doesn't have AC till next year, probably, if you haven't heard that yet. Hallelujah. But... On, on nights that it doesn't get cool, which last night it only got down to 70, that's when we're in trouble. How hot the day is doesn't matter, it's how cool the night gets. Okay, moving on. When we add or subtract, answers are, <coughs> excuse me, rounded <coughs> to the least significant decimal place. Oh no, I got, I got no liquid, <coughs> give me a minute.
All right, here we go. <clears throat> you ever have that? We're just, there's no way you can talk without sugar and caffeine. Okay, pretty much every football game. When addition or subtraction is performed, the answers are rounded to the least significant decimal place. Okay, these are very different. How you do this and this. A lot of times they'll look the same, but they are different. So when you do addition or subtraction, you just sort of look here and you think, all right, well, the least is just the one with the 10th place, right? Okay, so we do the math. I would have four, 4.750, right? You with me? I do the math, but that's not the answer. What would I do now? I have to round to which place, which number? Tell your partner. The, the 10th, or you have to round where seven is. You with me? So we see a five here that turns this into an eight, and those are completely ignored. So this answer here would be 44.8. Now, is that perfectly accurate? No, but the top number it was not measured with something that was very accurate. If in our minds, hopefully we think, all right, if it's 43.5, all I really know is it's 43 point something because the five would have been my guess. So I don't want to go farther because this decimal place is representing where my guess was. So in my answer, that decimal place, I know that's sort of my guess, all right? If I went past it, it would say, I knew it to the 10th place. Instead, I was guessing it was the 10th place. Okay, so you just see which one is shortest after the decimal, and that's the one you round. You do the math first, though. We wouldn't just say, all right, these don't matter. And we get 44.7. Okay, do the math first, then apply the rules. Sound good? Math first, then apply. Okay, multiplication and division. And we're going to do this one 99% of the time and like this 1%. Most of the time we're multiplying or dividing. So focus on the bottom one. When multiplication or division is performed, answers are rounded to the number of digits that corresponds to the least number of significant figures in any of the numbers used in the calculation. All right, so hopefully you have that part written down. It's hot, I'm just gonna sit down. Am I okay with that? No one answered, so the answer must be yes. Oh my, how am I gonna live with this desk? First try, <laughs> wow, it's like when you put the USB port in the right on the first try, which has never happened to me actually. I don't even think it's possible. Um, and the, the less convenient it is, the worse the chances are that you'll get it the first try. You know what I'm saying? So here we go. This is an application of this paragraph. 16.85 has four significant figures. Two has one significant figure. So my answer can only have one significant figure. Now that might be confusing because there's two numbers, right? But the zero doesn't matter at the end because there's no decimal. So we would say 16.85 times two is 30. Is that super right? No, but if all we have is a two in observation, that means I don't really even know what it is. I'm guessing it's between around a two to a three, but closer to the two. Like I don't, this is not a very accurate, not easy to repeat measurement, so not precise either. So the answer is a lot more vague. Okay, in the second one, 
16.85 still has four sig figs. 2.0 has two sig figs. So my answer now has two sig figs. All right now, this is a lot closer to the real answer. And that's because I had a more accurate measuring device. <laughs> what, where am I confusing you? You what? That's all right. I watched a documentary with Dallin two nights ago that proved math is wrong. Yeah, I'll send you the link. It blew my mind. But you know how they proved it was wrong? They made up like a whole different type of math to prove real math was wrong. So if you're making up fake stuff to prove something wrong, then I believe your argument is a little bit odd, but that's just me. We're not getting political right now. We're moving on. Okay, moving on. Now, here we go. This has four sig figs. This has three sig figs. So the maximum amount of significant figures in my answer is three sig figs. Now, did anyone watch the video? You can just lie right now too, because I'm not going to test you. How many watched it last night? You're welcome. Watch it at double time then. Then I only wasted three and a half minutes of your life. Okay, here we go. This, the analogy he uses is actually really good. That's why I want you to watch it. He says that a two isn't very accurate. So it's like, I'm, I'm downtown. Well, where are you? I don't know, but you're downtown. Do I know your location very well? No, this is like saying, I'm on 7th East downtown. You kind of, it's better, but do you know where? No, you know, 7th East, I'm from Salt Lake, so I'm using that example. I got roughly 15 miles of 7th East, but it's downtown, so I'm down to like four. I could find you. If I had to find you on 7th East downtown, I could do it. But if Dallin calls and he says, I'm at 5th West, sorry, not 5th West, 5th South and 700 East, I could find him. It would be a lot more accurate description. So I would know where to drive instead of just driving around downtown honking and yelling Dallin's name. It, the analogy is really pretty good. The more accurately we know the two values we start with, the more accurately we can report the answer. Yeah. So if you want to like 2.000, would you Yes, you would. And you just throw on zeros. Yep. Okay, now, when we, when, the reason like we get this once again is because we're gonna write these numbers in significant, or sorry, scientific notation. So this would equal three point, well, sorry, be three times 10 to the first. This would be 3.4 times 10 to the first. This would be 3.37 times 10 to the first. The, answer here or the sig figs tells me how many of these I put before my scientific notation. That's another reason why they are important. Okay, let's do some solving, some practice. Here you go. Take, let's see, 30 seconds for each one. You can use your calculators. You could use your phones. Sorry, Sky, I'm right in the way, huh? Oh, that cat has some blue eyes. Welcome back, Corbin, by the way. Great to see your beautiful red hair again. I will tell you most people get letter A wrong. Because the date. Because, oh, I was about to say, because they just don't like it. What'd you put? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Biggest waste of your time ever. That hurts my feelings. Palmer, 
That hurts my feelings. Oh my, I feel like I just got out of a sauna. You doing all right, Tim? Something happened at the cross country? Yeah. I just saw you like, okay. <laughs> I saw you before or after that. You definitely looked a little loop. Yeah, I was hot watching. Okay, let's talk. Who has all three of them done? Raise your hands. You don't have to put it in scientific notation right now. Okay, I'm gonna go. If you're if you're still going, it's fine. Okay, I looked at a few and and a few of you had it right. A few of you had it wrong. When you multiply this, you get is it 18.84? Yeah. And that can't be the answer because there's only one sig fig here, right? So the answer can only have one sig fig which means we round it to this place. So the answer is 20. Now, usually when you get it wrong, you round it to 19. And that seems to make sense, but a one and a nine are two significant figures and you can only have one. Okay, kind of weird. Yes. Two? Yeah, because you need the zero for the placeholder because two would mean two. 20 means it's close to 20. All right. Next up. Yes. So it's the second, whatever is in the second case of multiplication, or is it any sig figs? It's the least number of sig figs. Since this had one. Okay. Yep. All right. Letter B, I was smarter. I can do that math in my head. That is three. And then a lot of you just want to be done, but we can't be. How many sig figs here? Three, four. So my answer has to have how many? Three. So I'd put 3.00. And I'd call that one good to go. Now, does it matter if you type 3.00 or three in your calculator? No, this is just for writing answers on a test. Okay, uh, this would be what answer? We get 24.3050, but we can only have how many sig figs? Tell your partner, three of them, one, two, three. So we would round this three, there's a zero. So it's just 24.3, you okay with that? Who, who went three for three? All right, how many got the second two right, but not the first one? That's super common. So don't, don't stress about that one. It's just, it's uncomfy. Like 18.84 and it's 20. Well, yeah, sorry. In our, on our world of sig figs, it is. All right. So sig figs can lead to significant errors, but that's because we use something that was not accurate at all. As he put it in the video, he used the Barbie playset scale. Like you wouldn't use that to, to find the weight of the fuel you need to go to Mars, <laughs> right? There's a reason why NASA scales are $10 million or whatever. It's to ensure their accuracy and really their precision so that it's repeatable. Okay, now some actual application here. So on the test, you have to do density equation, which I don't think density is a hard thing to do. In an AP test, density, Come on, you learned that in fifth grade probably, but you have to apply the significant rules to your answer. So will you try number one? What is the volume of rock that has a mass of that and a density of that? Ready? Two minutes. If you get done fast, you can do the other one. That's kind.
All right, I didn't keep track of time. Who's done with at least the first one? Oh, okay, I'll slow down. Volume, by the way, did I teach you this circle? I did, right? Volume would be equal to mass divided by density. Oh, this one, I, I haven't taught you how to do a conversion yet. So let's just look at number one. The, the last section of the first chapter talks about dimensional analysis, right? We'll, we'll do this problem in a second, but let's for now. Uh-oh, my trick won't work if I can't select that. Well, that's a bummer. I have all of it written right here in white. <laughs> since I can't select this, I can't change the background color. So whatever. All right, the volume, I cover this up. That leaves me with mass divided by density, right? So it's 16.58 grams divided by 3.185 grams per milliliter. And uh, someone give me that number with like a lot of the values. Anyone still have that looking at you? All right, I might have missed an earther, but good enough, right? It's a long number. Don't put long numbers on your test. You look kind of silly. So how many sig figs does this number have? Four. How many does this one have? Four. So the answer should have four. So I'm going to round this five. This is a three. If I heard, oh, it's a six. All right, so my fault. 5.206 then would be my uh, volume, correct? How many have that right with the correct exact? Okay, the AP test gives you a margin of plus or one sig fig, plus or minus one when you round. So they would have given it to you 5.205 or six or four. Like they give you a tiny bit of wiggle room, tiny bit of wiggle room. Right, you can be off one thousandth, and they'll still give you credit. Two thousandths, though, too much. Uh oh. Um, all right, we got time. This is a multiple step problem. The density of zinc is nine point five six two grams. How many pounds would one liter of zinc weigh? There are four point five three grams in one pound. Yes, ma'am. But on this one or up here? Um, okay. Um, the three, I think it's 2.11 or 4.18. I don't, I don't know yet. Anyone else have an answer for that one? Okay. So first off, we want to know how many pounds, right? So we need to solve this for grams because this gives me grams per milliliter one liter is how many milliliter 1000 so i'm going to do the math normal and then i'm going to do my conversion okay so i want to know the mass in pounds but first i got to figure out the grams so mass over here is equal to Okay, density times volume, you with me? So I take 9.562 grams per milliliter and I multiply it, it's right here, D times V. I multiply that by 1000 milliliters. The reason I had to convert liters to milliliters is because the density was given to me in milliliters. Okay, so what do I end up with here? Nine 
9,562 grams, correct? All right, you have 9,562 grams, but I want to equal pounds. Okay, I'm gonna teach you a thing, and I don't teach you a ton this chapter, but we're gonna go over it a thousand times. I call it the picket fence, and it's how we do unit conversions. Now you don't, on this problem, if you did it, I see a lot of people are racing already. You probably did it fine, but this will be an introduction here. If I want to solve for pounds, I take the grams that I'm given and I put them in the top left corner here. And then whatever's on top, I'm going to multiply. So I want to get rid of grams. So I'm going to use this conversion right here. There are 453.6 grams per every what? One pound. So I take and I multiply this by one and divide by 453.6. Is that what you have, Sky? No, I have one. Uh, one liter is Oh, okay. Has anyone typed this in yet? Okay, well, just tell me the whole thing right now. Okay. So we would look, now be careful. Do you see how it says one pound? You might think, hey, that's one sig fig. In conversions, and we'll talk about this on Monday. In conversions, we assume they're forever. Like it's a standard thing. So if I give you a thing between a gram and a pound, don't consider it a significant figure value. It wasn't something we measured anyway. We measured this many grams and that many milliliters. Sorry, so we have three. 21.1 would be the right answer. Okay, 21.1, not good, Jackson? Oh, you good? Okay, study this weekend. We'll review on Monday, test Tuesday. You guys are great. Try and get your lab books or lab reports in as well. Right, for that one, the 1.00. 1 All right. Brooklyn, any, any questions? Oh, you left.